and the, the, the program shows there's about a 10 or 15 minute break while they reset the dais. Thank you. This Federal Circuit Court of Appeals Judicial Conference continues. In this session, circuit judges discuss their docket workload, rules, and decision-making process. This is an hour 20 minutes. All right, let us begin. Uh, for those, I think everybody's uh, biographies are in the programs. My name is Carter Phillips. Uh, this is the third program like this, what we call the en banc session with all of the judges of the Federal Circuit. Uh, in some ways, this is a follow on to the pri prior programs that, were, uh, that took place in 1999 and 2002. Uh, let me just say to those of you who practice before this court, uh, I, I would recommend that if you ever have an opportunity to go back and read uh, the transcript of those programs, which are reproduced at 193 Federal Rules Decisions 272 and 217 Federal Rules Decisions 575, there actually is a very large amount of what I thought was quite helpful information that's uh, in there. Obviously, brilliant questions were asked, but probably more useful is that the uh, answers that were given are extremely useful uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of trying to understand the nuts and bolts of the practice before the federal circuit. And there's a lot of good advice in there and Judge Dyke asked me a few minutes ago whether or not all of the good advice that comes out of these programs actually has any impact on the practitioners. In some ways the judges are in a better position to evaluate that than than I am, um, but it's certainly not going to have an impact if uh, the practitioners don't pay attention to it. So hopefully this program will be another opportunity to get some more insights into ways that you can improve the quality of, what you, of your performances uh, before the Federal Circuit. Um, I think it's probably worth starting this program in essentially the same way that we've started the last two, which is to get a sense of the docket and how the court uh, disposes of cases. Um, in 1999, according to the, the reported uh, numbers, that, as I read them out of the uh, Federal Rules decisions, the number of cases per judge was 225. In 2002, the number was 195. And in 2002, each judge was writing an average of 23 precedential opinions and 30 non-precedential. And that suggests that there are probably another eight cases per judge being disposed of under Rule 36, which is the summary disposal. Those were the numbers we had then, and I was going to ask the chief judge to begin by giving us an evaluation of how those numbers have changed, if any, and a comment on the impact of the docket, uh, both in terms of the workload that the court's experiencing these days and also some sense of how, what effect, if any, that has on the nature of the dispositions as between precedential and non-precedential. So, Chief Judge Michelle? Carter, I would say that the uh picture is very stable. The numbers have not changed greatly from 1999 to 2002, the last two years of conferences to uh, the 12 months preceding where we are right now. We still have 15 to 1600 filings a year. Half of them are disposed of by attorney settlement and the other half by panel adjudication. Uh, so the Fractions work out to be about 225 cases per judge currently. So that's very much in line with what it was before. In terms of the difficulty of cases, as I mentioned earlier, uh, every time we have one more patent case and one less of anything else, it tends to increase the burden on the court. And we have a steady accretion of additional patent cases, and they seem to become more difficult every year than the year before. So my perception is the workload has gone up hugely but the numbers are actually quite flat. In terms of the method of disposition, it changes very little. The precedential opinions always hover about a third of our dispositions. Non-precedential opinions hover close to 50% uh, in, in the high and mid-40s, and the balance uh, uh, of Rule 36 is. And again, those figures have changed very little from 99 to 02 to today. Great. Uh, Judge Bryson, one of the questions I always get asked 
as a practitioner is how, by the clients is how long is this going to take between uh, from the and, and obviously the, the in some ways the more pivotal period is not from the point in time when the filing takes place to the briefing is done because that's usually in the control of the litigants. It's after the briefing is completed and, and moving on toward argument and then final disposition. And so I've just wondered what is the answer I can give my client the next time I get that question. Well, by happy coincidence, I just was looking at those figures this morning. Uh, the, um, the, the numbers, you have to be a little cautious with these numbers as with all statistics, but um, the um, total period, you know, this does count the part that's on the lawyers, the period from the notice of appeal all the way to the final disposition um, is an average of uh, 9.8 months uh, for our court. Now that includes not only the argued cases, but also the submitted cases, and that makes a big difference when you break the statistics down. Uh, for the argued cases, uh, the number goes up to about 13.2 months. Now this compares uh, in all other circuits, um, and they lump submitted cases together with argued cases, the number is 11.8. So we're doing a little better than the average among all the uh, circuits. If you take out the period from docketing until the last brief is filed, which is fairly attributable to the lawyers <laughs> and their extensions of time and so forth, you end up with about six months in the argued cases. Uh, that includes uh, the period from uh, the last brief until the argument is set, and then the period from the argument until the opinion comes out. Uh, the period from the last brief until the time the argument is set runs now at about 3.7 months. Uh, then we add another 2.3 months for the court to come out with an opinion. Uh, Again, this is a little shorter in, in, in both cases than the average among the other circuits. Uh, and that I think, uh, in, in particular, given the fact uh, that we are, at least it's my impression from my own experience, we are fairly generous in entertaining applications to uh, postpone oral argument upon a showing of of need. Uh, some of that time is attributable to uh, lawyer requests as well. So uh, there is a um, uh, reasonably prompt opportunity for argument, I'd say. Uh, when you add in the applications for extensions and you add in some lead time that's necessary to, to give the, the attorneys uh, uh, advance warning of their impending argument, uh, there's really, I I'd say, a delay of a couple of months that is just uh, time that a case is sitting in the clerk's office waiting for assignment to a panel. Right, okay. Judge Lurie, is, the, is there anything internally that gets done to try to move the cases along and what kind of scrutiny is there of the timing and what met methods of persuasion, subtle or otherwise, are employed? Well, first of all, let me say, I think, I think the court is in quite good shape in terms of timeliness. Uh, we get monthly data circulated to us, and at last reading, uh, there were no cases that were more than nine months old from uh, date of submission, uh, date of argument. Uh, at the time I came on the court 16 years ago, there were approximately 25 that were more than a year ago, a year old. And that was obviously a real problem. And uh, apropos of the comment, one of some of the comments made this morning about whether we ought to take more cases in bank. Taking cases in bank really impacts the uh, timeliness of deciding our regular docket. Uh, I think we had close to 10 cases in bank in, in various stages in those early days. So uh, uh, I think we're in, we're in quite good shape now. In terms of the pressures that can be brought to bear, it's basically up to the authoring judge to decide to, to, to write his or her opinion and to circulate it. And some judges are clearly uh, faster than others. But uh, panel members generally do not nudge an authoring judge and say, where is that opinion? I haven't, haven't seen it yet. It, it, it just doesn't, doesn't uh, happen. 
uh, on the other hand, when an authoring judge circulates uh, a draft opinion and doesn't hear from a panel member, uh, <laughs> some of us get a little itchy <laughs> after a week, or especially after two weeks, and may just send a friendly note, or maybe now an email, and uh, is it possible that this got overlooked? <laughs> so, in that sense, we do nudge colleagues at least for a vote. A vote should be easier to uh, to get to gather than than a draft opinion. Uh, the chief judge certainly has the authority to uh, to uh, press uh, an authoring judge. Uh, happily, I haven't been <clears throat> on the receiving end of uh, such uh, pressure. Uh, uh, I have seen a, a chief judge, who will be nameless, send a note to the whole court saying it would be nice if we could, could get some of these uh, older opinions moving. <clears throat> but I should mention there are a lot of factors that, that can result in delay. <clears throat> there are many issues in some of these cases, and of course these are the issues brought by all of you. Uh, there may be a dissent. <clears throat> And the dissent usually is written after the draft majority opinion is written. And that takes time. And sometimes when the dissent is written, it shakes loose uh, 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 an earlier vote in favor of the majority <coughs> position, and you're back to square one. And then for presidential opinions, we circulate them to the full court. And while the full uh, non-panel judges uh, not supposed to, and generally don't say you got it wrong, B should have won, not A. When there are questions of conflict or statement of law, other judges do uh, <clears throat> sometimes have something to say, and that can lead to discussion around the court. And once in a while, there can be a sua sponte internal request for a poll, for an in-bank poll, and that takes time and sometimes we agree to have a discussion on the issue. And that can be put off until everyone's around, which may be a month. So there are a number of factors that can result in, in delay of, of decision. My own guideline, and, and the, the courts officially, or semi-officially, <clears throat> use 90 days as a guideline. They produce lists, and our court circulates a list of number of, opin of opinions by judge that are more than 30 days old. Uh, I use that as a guideline. Uh, sometimes cases can take up to uh, 180 days, six months, if they're complicated and have a lot of these other uh, factors operating. But those are generally the, the, uh, the parameters of how we operate and what the pressures are, subtle or otherwise. Chief Judge Michelle, do you have uh, something to say about the sending part of those messages as opposed to Judge Lurie's comment about the receiving part? It's only a footnote, but I, I do want to say two things. Uh, I think all of my colleagues are extremely conscious uh, about the running of the time. Uh, and carefully check these monthly computer lists to see which of their cases now are starting to get older than 30 days or 60 days. And secondly, uh, from time to time I send a little private communication and uniformly uh, colleagues have been highly responsive to that. I try to do it sparingly and it's uh, probably not welcome but once in a while it's probably uh, appropriate, possibly uh, even necessary. And finally, there are a number of colleagues, of course uh, unnamed, uh, who had something of a backlog uh, in the past. And uh, uh, those backlogs have been greatly reduced and in several cases entirely eliminated. And, and some of those judges are now highly current. So I offer that just uh, as a composite picture of how we try to be very mindful of the fact that your uh, clients are, are waiting for an answer. Appreciate that. Judge Lynn, uh, Judge Lurie just mentioned that sometimes you get together for a conference as the, of the entire court if you're debating a particular case. So I was, I was curious whether, given the ubiquity of emails in general, if that's changed some, the deliberative process that the court goes through as opposed to, do you communicate in person? Do you talk one-on-one? -on -one? Do you always meet as a group? Do you send emails back and forth? Is the, is the, has that process changed any over time? 
Well, when, <clears throat> when I came onto the court and, and to this day, the quote-unquote official mode of communication around the court is in writing <coughs> by memo. And I must say that coming from private practice, that was a, <coughs> a refreshing change of pace uh, uh, after those days of chasing after pages and pages of emails. Uh, but uh, the efficiency of email has now worked its way well into the halls of our court and more and more we're using emails for communication and um, many of us uh, will be uh, reading and preparing at home in the evening or on weekends and uh, sometimes when we're traveling and with the laptops, with the Blackberry devices, uh, the use of email facilitates uh, communication greatly. Uh, so uh, uh, to the point where we are now contemplating making email the new official channel of communication. Uh, you, you mentioned the internet and we of course are using the internet as well. Uh, occasionally we will use the internet on our own independently to do a little background research maybe on some technical issues. I won't say that's significant. I would say we are we're using the internet and computerized legal research extensively. Uh, m many of us old timers still like to, to flip through the books, but um, more and more we are using Westlaw and Lexis just like everybody else. Uh, we have downloaded software for uh, on all of the computers the judges use to uh, permit us to insert hyperlinks to Westlaw or Lexis for all the citations in our draft opinions, and that has greatly improved um, the ability of uh, the judges to review these opinions and to, uh, uh, and to check the background sources that are cited. Uh, so I think these are all very positive developments. As I, as I understand it, the use of this software is quite commonplace in law firms and corporate law departments, but it's not widespread in widespread use in the judiciary. Uh, but it's been very helpful to us, and I suspect these kinds of things will continue. Great. I want to. One thing I should say to you is that in the previous sessions, we sort of went through in an almost sequential order from beginning to end of the process, the appellate process. And the reason we're not doing that this time is because we've already, it's already out there. You can go read it. And what I'm trying to do here is to kind of fill in some of the holes, some of the questions we didn't get asked the last time, and then try to update some of the information as we go along. So if this seems a, a, a tad more scattershot than the last two, there, there is an explanation uh, for it. So on that note, I'll shift gears completely here and, and uh, ask uh, Judge Shaw uh, you spoke earlier this morning about the mediation uh, program, and um, so I don't think we need to kind of go through too much of the, of the nuts and bolts, but I, I, would, I, I was particularly interested in how you, so I know that, that mediators, you know, volunteer in a sense, or they apply, but I was wondering what criteria you use in evaluating uh, whether, you know, which mediators to select, and, and then I suppose the other question is, you know, how much in the market are you for more volunteers at this point? <laughs> Thank you, Carter. Well, I'll answer the, I'll answer the first, the second question first. We are very much, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the market for mediators. There's no question about that. As far as the process is concerned, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, the application form for mediation positions, voluntary mediation, mediation positions, is on our uh, the court website. It's also on the Federal Circuit Bar Association website. Uh, applications are submitted on either way. They come in to Ed Hoskin, our circuit mediation officer, and Ellie Thayer. They then are forwarded to the <clears throat> mediation committee which consists of uh, myself, Judge Gaiarsa, and Judge Dyke. And we review the, uh, the applications, and uh, in the case of applications that are accepted, the applicant uh, is notified, and then they're then placed on the roster of mediators that we have uh, for the program. Uh, in terms of the requirements, Starting out, the probably the most important requirement that we have looked at, and it's really a sort of a hurdle, if you will, is as it now stands, a mediator cannot be involved in the active practice of the law. 
that was a decision that we made earlier uh, when we set up the program and the purpose is to obviously to avoid possible uh, conflicts. That's the most important initial, uh, initial um, uh, requirement that we have to deal with. Um, the second requirement we have to deal with obviously is making sure that uh, we uh, have an applicant who's willing to serve on a, uh, on a basis on a pro bono basis without pay, except for remuneration of uh, uh, sort of incidental expenses. And finally, in terms of uh, once you get beyond that, we try and get the best sense we can as to looking at the person's credentials as to whether he or she, based on their experience, will be a good mediator uh, in the pilot program. So, Judge Dyke, you're on that committee. I just wondered if you have any early impressions about how the program's going or, or <coughs> changes that you might foresee in the not-so-distant future. Well, I, I think the, uh, having a mediation program could be very important to the court in, in reducing our workload. And certainly there are many cases in which uh, panel members, once the case comes to oral argument, we prepare for oral argument, uh, scratching our heads a bit, and, and wondering why this particular case didn't settle. Uh, I don't think yet the mediation uh, program has proved to be uh, as valuable as we would like it to be. We have uh, four settlements out of the pilot program, 20 cases going into mediation out of some 250 uh, which uh, have uh, been candidates for, for possible mediation. But the purpose of any pilot program is to learn from it. And there are issues that I think that the court will have to address uh, in the future uh, about the mediation program. One of those, and the first one, is going to be whether to make the program permanent. And if we do make the program permanent, then there will be a number of questions about how it should be structured. And, and probably the most important of those is whether the program is going to be mandatory. And right now, it's, it's voluntary. And that may explain, to some extent, the uh, low response rate that, uh, that we've achieved so far. Uh, there are other issues, including uh, whether uh, certain categories of cases should, should continue to be excluded from the program. One large category of cases that's excluded is pro bono, uh, pro se cases. And uh, 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 there are real questions as to whether a mediation program really should include those. There are other questions that have been raised with us, such as whether the mediators uh, appointed by the court should be compensated, uh, whether uh, we should have a mediation staff which handles some of these mediations. For example, as the D.C. Circuit does, they have, a, a voluntary, uh, they have voluntary mediators just as we do, but they also have staff who mediate some of the cases. And, uh, these are the kinds of issues that we'll uh, be uh, considering, and I think it would uh, be very valuable to us, as Chief Judge Michelle and Judge Shaw have mentioned earlier, to have feedback from the bar as to how this program can be improved and how it can be made more successful, because it has the potential to be of great assistance to us. Right. Chief Judge Michelle, can I ask you about the, the, the what, if any, training? the court provides to the mediators or is the expectation that they come with their own experience and, and therefore you don't need any at this point? I believe we have a strong preference for people who have some training and experience with mediation, but we also have provided some very high quality training through the uh, Federal Judicial Center. Uh, and uh, the participants in the two training sessions we've had were all uh, highly pleased with the value and quality uh, of it. So uh, we require some on the way in and then we provide some more and it uh, has been uh, very well received. And Judge Shaw, can I just go back to you for one question? Do you have a kind of a projected date to come out with uh, sort of the next round of, of changes or evaluations of the, of the pilot program? I mean, what's the sunset provision for the pilot program at this point? Well, there is no, thank you, there is no uh, sunset provision per se. As I indicated in my brief remarks earlier, we are in the process now of assessing the program and its experience and the experience that we've had with it over the first uh, six to seven months 
And I would think that within a time frame of looking into the fall, we'll be sitting down and deciding these various questions as to, number one, what changes do we want to make in the program in its present format? And then two, uh, looking at some of the broader questions uh, to which Judge Dyke alluded. Can, can I ask you one last question on that? When, when you adopted this program, did you pattern it after any of the other circuits, or did you sort of pick and choose what you thought were the best practices? We looked, uh, we were given um, really a lot of information with respect to uh, what other circuits do. We followed uh, guidelines, as I recall, specifically from the uh, Seventh Circuit, the Eighth Circuit, and uh, we had some very uh, helpful meetings uh, with the uh, circuit mediation officer, uh, Nancy Stanley, in the D.C. circuit. Right, okay. Uh, Judge Garza, obviously from my perspective, the most important part of this process is the uh, oral argument process. <laughs> so we'll shift gears slightly to this. One of, one of the complaints, at least, that, that some people, you know, a lot of these questions come from members of the bar. I, I didn't make all these up. So <laughs> we'll start We'll start with that, but the uh, but but one of the questions that was asked is, you know, there's sometimes it, it seems, at least maybe to the litigants, that the time for oral argument is not always fairly allocated. That is, the there's 15 minutes assigned, and then and the red light goes on. And some judges let the red light mean something, and other judges don't let the don't require the red light to mean anything. In my experience, at least at the Supreme Court, if the red light goes on, you stop in the word, middle of the word it. And, and it's a little easier with the new Chief Justice, but not a whole lot easier than it, than it was. And I was just wondering whether or not the court has given thought to perhaps coming up with a, a more uniform approach to take with respect to the timing of oral argument. Well, Carter, as you all know, at the Supreme Court, if uh, you're in the middle of a sentence, a trap door opens and you fall right through. <laughs> That's well, why my knees are so bad. <laughs> we don't have the trap door effect at the uh, Federal Circuit. I think any kind of a rule which sets a fixed time uh, is still under the control of the panel itself and by the senior member of that panel. The clock is controlled by the senior member for the most part, and 15 minutes is a rule I think that uh, for the most part works quite well. well one of the uh, aspects obviously is that the panel itself, if it is very active in questioning there is time which is added, and normally the person who is the senior member of the panel will allocate time to both sides on that basis. Right. For instance, we had a case in uh, just recently, this past uh, court week, where each side was given an additional 10 minutes because of the number of questions that the panel had. And I think a flexible time period with a control by the member of the, uh, the senior member of the panel is a much better rule, I, in my judgment, than trying to set a fixed time. But I think even if we set 20 minutes, and there's a lot of questions from the panel members, you're going to go over that time period. So more flexibility would be built in. I think 15 minutes per side is a rule which, for the most part, is followed. But for the appropriate cases where uh, there are complex issues and maybe more questions from the panel, we do need the additional time. And the person in the middle does essentially allocate that time to both sides. Does anybody ever, I mean, have you thought about the possibility of after the briefs are filed and read by the panel to think about whether ahead of time you would identify this one as potentially more complicated and therefore give it a, an extra five minutes or an extra ten minutes? We, we have uh, a number of times uh, on panels that I've sat on, the members of the uh, panel agreed to give particular parties additional time to, answer, uh, to uh, present their oral argument. Yeah, I didn't ask anybody to collect the data on this, but do, do, do you know off the top of your head whether or not the requests by counsel for additional time, if they're made, are, tend to get granted or not granted? Uh, several of those cases were uh, sui sponte and a part of the panel, and sometimes the uh, parties do ask for additional time, and, and for the most part, uh, the panel is uh, probably more inclined to say 15 minutes with some liberal overage on each party. And, and I didn't ask this question either, but it just, it just occurred to me. Sometimes it has struck me, at least not necessarily in the federal circuit, but certainly in other circuits, if I had an unusually complicated case, it oftentimes ends up as the last case of the day. Uh, is there any effort or, uh, made along those lines that you could identify? 
not, not necessarily by uh, my own experience at the Federal Circuit, but you're right, a number of the regional circuits and even the state Supreme Courts, uh, the time periods are extended uh, to the point where uh, everybody is falling asleep by the time he's finished with the oral <laughs> argument. But uh, I, I believe that from my past experience with several of the regional circuits, that the federal circuit probably has one of the better allocations of time for oral argument than some of the others. Right. Judge Prost, uh, this is a subject that's sort of somewhat near and dear to my heart because I think I was one of the stronger proponents of it. And for a very brief period of time, uh, the court experimented with uh, allowing the panels to be identified a few days ahead of time. Um, I welcomed that change, and then about as quickly as I got accustomed to the fact that it existed, then it was withdrawn rather summarily. I wondered, one, if we could get some kind of an explanation for what happened, and then two, I'd be, one, interested in other people's opinions as well, but also just trying to figure out whether this is a dead issue now or something that I can keep banging my head against the wall on. <laughs> Um, well, I, I can't give you an official position. I don't think there is one, and I don't necessarily know the details of why my colleagues necessarily took the positions they did. I mean, certainly, Carter, we heard from you and others, and it was the fair position of the bar to assist them, I presume, in being more prepared and be, be, being able to be more responsive to the judges that the bar sought this change. And I think again that it I think it was the feeling of many of our colleagues that the result of that was at least anecdotally was that attorneys assumed or thought that if they knew the judge it would somehow serve their purposes to direct their argument to a particular judge and his or her views is expressed in a particular opinion and as one of my colleagues has said from the bench previously when a lawyer tells him well you said such and such and such and such case judge lorry judge lorry would quickly quickly remind the attorney that it was the court's opinion and not his opinion. <laughs> and so I think there was a feeling from the bench that it person kind of personalized the cases for the attorneys or they felt that they should personalize it to the judges and I don't think we felt that that's the way the argument ought to operate. Does anybody on the panel want to at least, I mean I don't necessarily want to identify who the lawyers were, but anybody who had that experience and, and why it was particularly off-putting. I just wondered if, I realize that's a wide open, uh, Judge Blager. <laughs> uh, when we first started on that, I was a strong advocate of the lawyer's position. That is, I thought it would be useful for the lawyers to know who was going to be on their panel. But I have to say that uh, it didn't take long before I began to see some rather strategic behavior on the part of counsel, including the fact that you're looking at me right now worries me a little because I'm. <laughs> yeah, guilty conscience became very apparent. Uh, uh, including the pulling of a case from the court right before we were prepared to hear all argument, and particularly after I'd spent some hours reading through those dense briefs. Uh, no bitterness thought, there. Which I thought was rather <laughs> offensive, you know, if they're going to pull the case, they should do it before I have to read their briefs. Uh, but it was, it was uh, not only the point that Judge Prost made, which is a good one, but also uh, evidence of some strategic behavior which struck me as, as just not consistent with what we had been represented to be the reasons for uh, making that information available. So. Uh, uh, I, for one, now am not so sure it's a good policy to to reveal the panels or change our normal practice. G given the, the preference, if possible, to increase the number of cases that settle, Judge Bryson, I wondered whether, you know, one, one possibility is if you re release the names of the judges as the D.C. Circuit does well ahead of time, that a lot of court, a lot of litigants may say, whoa, I don't, want to, I don't want to take a chance with that particular panel. Let's settle this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, we, I think we get that's... a situation where the names of the judges are revealed if you go into the mediation program. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the uh, D.C. Circuit, I, I think, expressly aims at that result. And uh, along, however, with the proviso that you get the names well in advance. You also get a date certain, and 
no excuses, no continuances, no, uh, gosh, I, uh, you know, I had a, uh, uh, a no refund ticket to uh, the Bahamas and please reschedule this because of, of course, the, the risk of uh, trying to get a different panel on the second draw. Uh, one of the things that we do, and we think this is a good thing, is to uh, be fairly lenient with people who come in and they say, you know, we just can't be there on uh, the 5th of March. Uh, can you kick it over until the next month or the next time uh, it's available? And of course, if we haven't revealed the names of the judges, then the risk of panel manipulation is, is much reduced. Um, so while it's true that you may get some settlements, whatever you think of the merits of settlements that are induced by revealing the identity of the judges, uh, I think you also lose something uh, in terms of something that may be valuable to the lawyers, which is a certain amount of flexibility. Can, can I ask you one question procedurally? If, if does, it, does it sometimes happen that a litigant will ask to move the argument back after the briefs have been distributed to the panel? Oh yeah, that happens. Well, typically. And then does this, then I was going to ask, and then if that happens, does the panel stay on, or do the briefs then get recirculated well, to a new panel? That's tricky for us because uh, it just depends. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But uh, one of the problems is that uh, it's each of the uh, sittings, of course, are, are set a month or so in advance, and you have to kind of make a special provision to reassemble that panel. Right. Uh, and you end up with an extra argument somewhere in the middle of an argument a week, usually in the afternoon when you can get those judges together. So administratively, it's a little more difficult. But yes, we get a lot of, of motions for continuances that come in that, you know, I, I'm a sole practitioner, I was planning to be there, but uh, my wife uh, broke her leg and I, I, I can't leave. And so please kick this case over. And in a sufficiently sympathetic case, we do... Uh, grant those kinds of motions, but the D.C. Circuit doesn't. Right. Their, their position right. is, that's too bad, um, you know, find another lawyer. Or of course, of course they tell you very far out well, they ahead of time. Like it, but they don't so tell it's... you that your wife is going to break her leg. It's good that they don't, actually. <laughs> any, any dissenting views from the change in the rules on the panel? No? Okay. Well, uh, just just a, a, a point of information. I, I think it's important to remind people that if you, if you have a conflict that uh, you foresee in the future, there's another way to uh, solve the problem other than to wait until the, the case has been assigned to a panel, and that is to ask, tell the clerk's office that you, you foresee this problem in the month of October or you're not available on October 8th, and could the clerk's office please set the, the case for another day? And my understanding is Clerk's office very cooperative about that, and that's the way it should be done. Where, you, where uh, apart from the broken leg situation, you foresee a conflict in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I'd like to. It'd be, it's worth at some point, I suppose, having the clerk, so a representative of the clerk's office here, to be able to ask questions because I'd, I'd be curious to know what the answer is in terms of how common that practice is and, and what the response is. At some point, Chan, you may want to make an observation about that uh, as part of one of these sessions. Or, uh, let, me, let me just add one further point. Everyone should understand uh, th this is not a, simply a matter of administrative convenience. The, you know, you're on the printed schedule, so you want to be there. Our court, I think, uniformly is a court that spends an enormous investment of time by the judges and time by the law clerks in preparing for your arguments. And so there is a very large investment of court time and court energy. We don't have a system, for example, uh, I sat out in the Ninth Circuit last year, and in, under their system, one judge on the panel takes responsibility for really preparing the brief, the court memos, uh, what we call uh, uh, the memos from our law clerks. They have one judge prepare the memos for the entire panel. We don't do that. In each of our panels, each judge takes responsibility for all of the cases before that panel. So everything is multiplied by three. So there's a big investment in time and energy and, and effort in preparing for your argument. 
and if for some reason you can't show up or you decide your wife broke her leg or whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, you really do you really do cause uh, a, a very large dislocation and reallocation of effort within the court. Actually, I was going to ask the I didn't ask this question either before, but um, and maybe Judge Bryson, you could answer it. The, you know, there are obviously a significant number of cases that get submitted on the briefs as opposed to the oral argument. One, it, do you think that's the right mix that that takes place, or would you rather have some of those cases actually argued, or, or and sometimes you regret that you didn't have an oral argument in some of those cases? Well, yeah, I do. Uh, I don't know that I'm the the typical person on this on the court because I I'm a big advocate of of the value of oral argument, and I think. I would put it this way, that I see more cases in which I wish that there had been argument than I do cases in which I wish there hadn't been argument. Um, some of the submitted cases, uh, some, particularly some of the cases that people uh, uh, submit close to the time of argument, turn out to be cases in which I had prepared questions that I really wanted to know the answers to. And it's, it's awkward. You can always send them a letter and say, please respond to this question. But you don't get much interchange back and forth. I was looking forward to getting uh, some kind of exchange with the lawyers that would clarify something important to me, at least, about the case, or show me that my concerns were not, in fact, important to the case. And I don't get it. Um, so yeah, there's. Uh, I, I think oral argument is a very valuable part of the process, and uh, I think that some of the cases that are submitted are uh, ones that I regret seeing. <laughs> Judge Lurie, you wanted to say something? I think it's important to note that all counseled cases are scheduled for oral argument. Cases submitted by pro se's are not for the reason that we find they just want to tell a story as if we were a trial court and they don't focus on the law or the real legal error. But when a counsel case is not argued, it's generally because the parties uh, waive argument and, and stipulate to that. Now, I think our, our procedure is more tolerant of oral argument, if you want to call it that, than some, some of the other circuits. I've sat in other circuits and, and still do. And at least on two of the circuits I've sat on, the procedure is the only cases that are argued are those that at least one of the lawyers wants to hear. And, and they set up nine or ten cases for a day, and the lawyers decide, I'm mean, sorry, the judges decide what should be argued, and maybe three uh, out of three or four out of that ten are argued. So I think we have quite. Uh, <coughs> A, to a tolerant policy with respect to oral argument. Yeah, well, as somebody who uh, <laughs> enjoys oral arguments, I appreciate it. I must say, Judge Lynn. Uh, yes, I would just like to add that uh, we do see from time to time uh, cases that are submitted on the briefs uh, by pro se parties that raise uh, very important, sometimes uh, uh, issues of first impression. And uh, we have started. Uh, in those kinds of cases to uh, appoint counsel to represent the parties so that we can um, facilitate oral argument and have those issues fleshed out in an oral argument before they're decided. And I think that is a, a very positive, fairly new development. Yeah, Chief Judge Michelle, you and I talked about that a little bit. I was going to ask you about the, the pro bono process and the extent to which there is a, I mean, a lot of, a lot of circuits do have programs where lawyers volunteer to represent uh, pro se litigants, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, historically, I don't think the circuit has had that, but as Judge Lynn said, there's now some movement in that direction. I was just curious sort of how formal it is and where, where it is in the process at this point. Well, at present, it's rather informal. Uh, we've had some discussion among ourselves, and I've made some phone calls. And fortunately, uh, uh, a handful of very experienced, distinguished counsel agreed to take uh, assignments in pro se cases on a pro bono basis. Uh, I expect that the numbers won't be large, but I do think we'll have a steady stream each year of a handful or two, perhaps, of cases where we'll, we'll need a volunteer. And I'm very hopeful that uh, there'll be a willingness throughout the bar and 
I'll be able to make more phone calls to more people and get more yeses. <laughs> Judge Newman, uh, the, both the Chief Judge and Judge Shaw today have commented on sort of the increasing complexity of the cases that come that have come before this court. You've got obviously significant experience in this, and I just wondered, from your perspective, do you think the cases have become more complicated, uh, and is that the reason why it seems, even though the numbers don't look as though the, there's more of a burden on the members of the Federal Circuit than there were before, that the, that the nature of the cases has imposed a, a greater burden on you to, to deal with the caseload? Well, I don't think it's a matter of complexity of the cases. What I think happens is that we have now such a large body of, of law, generally consistent, and if not with a, a procedure for remedying the consistency, so that the questions of, of law are not perhaps as difficult or as complex as they were 20 or 15 years ago. But what has happened, it seems to me, is that the issues that are being litigated are issues that might not have come to court in the past, either because a patentee might have felt there was no hope, or a potential infringer might have felt that with the vast body of decisions that we have. There are opportunities that didn't exist. What I find is that the cases in general are much more difficult to decide, not so much as a matter of complexity, but because they now tend to be in the gray areas where there are abutting principles of law, where the policy either has not been developed or where the policy uh, favoring one result or another might be in conflict and have not yet benefited from uh, an accumulation of, of precedent. So it's been, it's become quite clear to me that many of our cases are much harder to decide, at least harder for me to decide. Again, not because of the complexity of the issues, but because they tend to tread new ground that hasn't previously been decided and requires thinking and comprehension that hadn't been uh, required as the law was being developed in those areas. And I see this, and this isn't limited to the patent situation. In fact, it seems to me that it occurs more in our other areas of jurisdiction than in the patent area. Just Plager, if the cases, and I don't know if you agree with that the cases have some way become harder to decide, but it seems to me to the extent that that's true, it would give some additional weight to the comment that was made in the 2002 session by one of the judges who said that the, the, what annoyed him in particular was the failure of counsel either in the briefing or at the oral argument to say right up front, this is the mistake that was made by the trier of fact or the decision maker in the proceeding below and this is why that decision ought to be changed, that decision is wrong. And, or alternatively, obviously, you've gone on the other side why the decision was right. And I just wondered, one, I thought that was great advice. I hope everybody in this room both heard it at the time and has, and has followed it. But I'm just curious, as you're the consumers of that advice more, do you see any changes over time in that regard? We, we see, of course, and, and the rules provide a, a, a statement of the issues in the beginning of the briefs. And so we have a sense of what they are. The perhaps most notable difference has been because of treating the Markman situation as a question of law. There are a number of issues that are presented to us uh, on the uh, anticipation that they will receive de novo review sure. rather than uh, deference to often very extensive and, and, and uh, profound uh, rulings. By the, by the district court. But in terms of increasing the number of issues or making them more complex, uh, there are certainly variations among brief writers. But I think that many of you have also noticed that one of the first questions that you'll get from the bench is, what is this case all about? What is the issue uh, if there is one or two that will be dispositive of the appeal? All right, but Judge Plager, if you're gonna ask that question anyway, shouldn't the lawyers answer the question for you at the outset rather than wait for you to ask that question? Uh, Seth Waxman, I thought this morning, raised a very interesting uh, question about the role of the Supreme Court uh, and noting that uh, two ways of looking at what the Supreme Court's 
duty is, that is, does it uh, only step in when the circuits are in disagreement and if the circuits are in general uh, comfortable with a particular rule, the Supreme Court ought to mind its business, or does the Supreme Court see itself as a court of errors and uh, will step in when they think there's some substantive or perhaps even procedural error going on. Uh, we don't have, in our court, in my view at least, uh, any doubt about what we are and what we do. I view us as uh, a court of errors. That doesn't mean we make them. <laughs> our job is to identify reversible error if there happens to be one by a trial judge and then correct it and give proper guidance to that judge and all judges as to uh, why there was an error and how to correct it and how it shouldn't happen again. In our rules, we require that at the beginning of every brief, appellant's brief, there be something called the statement of issues, which uh, Judge Newman referred to. Uh, I, for one, always look at that statement at the beginning because I use that as a limiting factor on what it is I'm going to concern myself with in the case. That is, I don't want to hear about all the wonderful things that went on in the trial court that you didn't find to your satisfaction. What I want to know is exactly what error is it that the trial court made that you want us to treat as a reversible error and need correction. I have to confess, however, that so often the statement of issues is useless uh, or uninformative because it starts out by saying something like, the trial court or the district court erred in X, Y, and Z, for, and then goes on for about 15 lines uh, <laughs> trying to capture the whole litigation in one paragraph. Not very useful. No reason that it has to be in one sentence. It's not like a patent claim. Uh, you, you can actually make a literate statement if you want to using more than one sentence, and that can be helpful to us. Uh, moving to the broader question that Carter has raised, and that is, I know you know your case, and I'm delighted that you do, well, in most cases. <laughs> And, and that's very helpful, but it's not helpful if you start out in the middle of your case and then go on to whatever you think is the end of the matter that you're bringing before us, because we don't even know what you're talking about. We don't know what the subject matter is. We have a broad jurisdiction. We have a lot of different issues. Even within the patent law, there are any number of possible issues that can be raised, and if you start in the middle of your case, we don't know what you're talking about. So I would urge that you begin at the beginning. You tell us what your case is really basically about, and then you develop your point. It, it, uh, Carter asks if there's been some change since the last time we gave this little lecture. <laughs> I'm delighted to have the opportunity to give it again. Uh, <laughs> And I guess the answer to it is, Carter, I have not done a statistical study. Uh, but my impression is that there's been no dramatic change in the way the bar <laughs> writes its briefs. And that's to be under, that's to be expected. I, I didn't really think there would be a dramatic change, but we would urge you for the benefit of your client uh, that you listen up on this particular point because it's helpful to us, but it's also helpful to your client. It's a continuing matter, Carter, that I think we have to simply keep reiterating from year to year. And, uh, I appreciate your willingness to, to give us that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one, of, one of the big changes that will affect how all of us write briefs, I think, in the, in the foreseeable future is the change in the rule that allows the citation of uh, non-precedential uh, opinions. And uh, this circuit, I think, Judge Bryson, was probably the most vocal in opposition to that rule change, but now it's in place. Um, it, I, I know it will affect some of what I have to do with respect to research. I'm more curious what you think it'll, what effect, if any, it'll have either on what you do, what you write in the non-presidential opinions and what you what you plan to use, you know, how the court will respond to those when they start being cited. 
Well, I, I think that really remains to be seen, and I think it may well uh, depend very much on how the lawyers respond to uh, the new rules. Now, just to, to be clear, because it, it, this has been uh, a little confusing in the development of this new appellate rule, uh, the appellate rules committee had proposed to them uh, a, a rule that would essentially abolish all non-presidential opinions, making every opinion not only citable, but also uh, require it to be treated as a full presidential opinion. The Appellate Rules Committee did not adopt that proposal, but instead uh, adopted a more modest proposal. We opposed the more modest proposal. Well, that uh, was adopted over our objection. And that modest proposal is that you may cite the, uh, in, indeed, not only may you cite, but no court may have a rule that prohibits you from citing non-presidential opinions. Uh, however, the appellate rule did not go on to say that any court must treat those non-presidential opinions as precedent. Now, uh, the change in the appellate rule will, of course, require us to change our rule, rule 47.6b, which now provides that you may not cite non-presidential opinions. And we are in the midst of making that change. However, of course, the one thing we uh, we will not uh, be able to retain in that rule is the, uh, uh, to prohibit the citation, but we will be able to retain, if we so, so choose, the portion of the rule that uh, says we will not treat non-presidential opinions as presidential. Now, that raises the question of, of whether this is going to result in a, a, a big change in our process. Uh, I think if we see uh, cases in which uh, non-presidential opinions are being cited in droves to us uh, in the hopes that uh, uh, that we may be persuaded by finding opinions uh, uh, in large numbers which lawyers assert without necessarily being correct uh, stand for the propositions they're trying to advance. I suppose it could result in our uh, either cutting back in numbers of non-presidentials uh, or issuing more Rule 36s in order to avoid that. Uh, I, would, I would suggest um, that th there was a, a, a comment, if I can cite one of my colleagues, uh, that was made to the uh, Appellate Rules Committee at the time this new rule is, was being uh, <laughs> proposed, uh, which uh, was made by Judge Dyke, and he pointed out that one of the real risks of this rule change uh, he felt was that lawyers would be uh, more uh, <coughs> enticed, maybe than even before, to write briefs which are uh, uh, essentially a, a collection of numerous citations in an effort to try to find a case that's close on its facts to the particular case, as opposed to arguing based on reasoning uh, and analysis, but instead just larding up the brief with cases and cases and cases. And I would commend to you even though that uh, suggestion may not have persuaded the Appellate Rules Committee, I would commend to you that the suggestion is a good one for lawyers to take into consideration. Judge Lurie? Just a little, little footnote. The chairman of the Appellate Rules Committee uh, that, that formulated this new rule and one of the members have both now been <laughs> elevated to the Supreme Court, so we've stopped <laughs> protesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't have great hope for the for your opposition to the rules as these as those developments uh, <laughs> unfolded. Uh, Judge Prost, I wondered if we could shift. In some ways, I should ask this question as a follow up to the questions from Judge Newman and and um, before. But uh, there were two comments that were made in the previous session, and I, I can't remember now whether there was one. One was in 1999, the other in 2002. But there were two separate comments. One of the judges said that the cases, you know, there are a very large number of very easy cases, and somebody else said that there's a huge number of very difficult cases. And I think those comments actually can be reconciled, but I thought I would, I would ask at least one of the judges first to try to reconcile those observations uh, for this audience. Well, first let me say that I, as the junior judge, I take great comfort when I hear judges, experienced judges like the chief and Judge Newman comment that the cases are getting harder because it's very comforting to hear that, because I find many of them very difficult. But the difficulty comes in different varieties. 
Um, there are some cases where the science of the technology is just very complicated. And thank goodness we have a lot of very well-suited, technical, brilliant clerks to help us out in that regard. And then there are just cases that happen to be close on the facts, and those cases probably were always around and continue to be around. And I, I agree and I understand Judge Newman's observations about the evolution of the law. I must say, I came from Capitol Hill, I had spent 12 years, and the solution to questions which you can't agree on on Capitol Hill is, well, let's just let the courts decide. <laughs> um, I did not know then what I know now, which is I'd be at the receiving end of some of those legislative <laughs> provisions. And we get a lot of statutory construction issues. That's why the veterans cases and the personnel cases tend to be very, very interesting and challenging as well because there are novel and interesting issues of statutory construction. And then there are cases, and my colleagues have alluded to this morning, that become complicated largely because of the failings or the intentions of some of the advocates, which sometimes try to make the science and the technology even more difficult than it necessarily <laughs> has to be, um, or try to hide the ball, or submit incomplete appendices, which make it much more difficult for us to delve into the record where that becomes necessary. But if you want an answer, I'll go down the middle and say 50%. <laughs> <laughs> Challenging and difficult. <laughs> Anybody have a different percentage in mind at this point? <laughs> uh, one of the things we're supposed to be focused on in this, in this program is sort of what's the future look like. And it seems to me that one of the interesting developments that, that'll probably Im impact at least some people in this room in the future is video conferencing as a mechanism for oral advocacy. Obviously, people who live in the district probably won't have that bit of a problem, but for advocates in the California, uh, having the capacity for video conferencing is, a, is at least a potentially uh, a good thing. Um, and Judge Lynn, I was uh, wondering, one, what's the status of that technology at the Federal Circuit at this point, and then sort of what's the prognosis for the future in terms of the use of that technology? Well, of course, uh, before our ceremonial courtroom, courtroom 201, was refurbished, we really didn't have uh, effective uh, video conferencing capability, uh, but we now do. In courtroom 201, there are cameras that are directed toward each of the three judges on a three-judge panel. There's a camera directed toward counsel at the lectern. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that system has been in place long enough now where we have pretty much gotten the bugs out of the system and I think it works fairly effectively. Uh, our courtroom 402, uh, when it's refurbished, will have the same capabilities. Uh, now because we didn't have that capability before, that was something that was really not considered uh, video conferencing. Uh, but it undoubtedly is a, a topic that will come up uh, and will be considered. Uh, there hasn't been a tremendous uh, impetus toward having video conferencing, and I think that's understandable uh, for a number of reasons. There, first of all, there is real, really no substitute for the intimacy uh, provided for having counsel in person in the courtroom with the judges for a face-to-face -face interchange. Uh, there's no substitute for that, no matter how good the technology is. Uh, secondly, of course, our court, we have the benefit of uh, being all in the same building, so we're not spread out like s several of the circuits. Uh, and uh, the lawyers that appear before us are quite accustomed to traveling for the most part and don't find that to be particularly problematic. Uh, ha having said that, with the capability in place, with our nationwide jurisdiction, uh, I, I think it's an important subject that will come up and will be considered. Uh, and no doubt uh, there will be cases, uh, certainly in the short term, where there is justification for having a video conference argument. But for the moment, anyway, that's the exception, not the rule. Uh, Judge Dyke, I, I, this, that, I didn't give you this question ahead of time, but that, what raises in my mind, obviously, is if you have video conferencing capabilities, you also have cameras in the courtroom. And one of the big controversies, obviously, certainly at the Supreme Court level, is whether to put cameras in that courtroom. But there's also legislation, I think, to uh, require, maybe not require, but to create a presumption of cameras in the courtroom 
before all of the courts of appeals, and I'm just curious what, uh, as, a, as one who advocated in the Supreme Court for a substantial period of time, what your view was on cameras in the courtroom in general. Well, I'm, I'm kind of recused on that question, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's not, I think it's not a big issue for our court. We haven't had a lot of requests uh, for uh, camera coverage, uh, and I, I'd be surprised if that changed in the future. My own experience, uh, having argued, uh, I don't know, two, three, four times uh, in courtrooms that, that had cameras in it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't that different, that, that, uh, the concerns that people have about having cameras in trial courts in general don't apply to courts of appeals. But I think there are different views about it, and that there probably any requests uh, would be considered on an ad hoc basis. Now, as I understand the legislation, even under the legislation, it's up to a particular panel as to right. whether to allow it in, in any individual case. Uh, just one follow-up uh, comment on the, on the uh, video uh, conferencing for argument. I I'm, uh, would be very unhappy to see uh, that happen very often. I think it's, uh, 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 as, as Judge Lynn said, a huge benefit uh, to having the, the lawyers present there in the courtroom and having all the judges present there in the courtroom. And uh, I suppose it's inevitable that just as we, we uh, sometimes have somewhat frivolous requests to uh, move a case from one date to another because someone wanted to attend a party, which has happened. <laughs> well, that's, that's nicer than breaking your wife's leg. <laughs> that, uh, we, will, we will see requests for, for a video argument because somebody uh, wanted to argue a case from, the, from their beach house. <laughs> may not be too well Well, I will tell you as an advocate at least that having done, handled at least two cases through the video conferencing technology, um, it, it is very disembodied experience. It, it just, it, there is something very much lost from this side of the podium through that process. Uh, and and it may, eventually, I suppose, the technology will improve, but there is still a terrible talking over problem that comes up. and. You know, one of the keys to advocacy in general, in my experience, is to listen to the other person. And if you think you're talking and they think you're, that they're talking at the same time, the ability to listen, I think, is, is largely lost. That said, I, I do think, you know, in response to the comment that Judge Bryson made, which is there are some cases that get submitted on the briefs that it would be nice to have at least some opportunity to ask questions for, it does seem to me that this could provide at least uh, an opportunity in some instances. Carter, I think you have to uh, differentiate between video video conferencing and videotaping of the oral argument. Right. Um, I think most judges probably would not object to videotaping of the argument. We have videotaping uh, possibilities at the Federal Circuit right now. <coughs> video conferencing is a separate issue. Right. And I think what the uh, legislation does do is uh, allow video taping, taping right. of the right. uh, oral arguments. Right. I'm mixing and matching some of these things, but uh, Judge Lurie, there, there was a proposal, actually there are two proposals out on the table right now, I think one's going to die pretty quickly about expanding the court's jurisdiction to deal with the immigration cases, and there's another one to expand uh, with respect to the asbestos cases. I've just uh, given, given the sense that uh, you, the people at this podium feel, or at this bench feel a little overworked at the moment strikes me that uh, those are probably not proposals that are going to meet with a great deal of enthusiasm here, but I thought I'd at least ask about it. <laughs> you all know the meaning of the word tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> we have 1,600 cases per year now, adding 12,000 totally transforms the court. Uh, we don't course decide, and the Chief Judge has been very careful not to uh, indicate uh, that we would or would not like that or other jurisdiction, but he's also pointed out in testimony uh, the effect that it would have on the court. We need a large number of new judges. We probably need another building. Based on the present numbers, our jurisdiction would be about 88% immigration cases, which uh, is, is uh, obviously would, would make it a, a, a different court. Now, whether it makes sense to have those cases reviewed by a national court of appeals, 
I, I have no opinion. Uh, I have uh, heard a few immigration cases on uh, other circuits, but that hardly makes me an expert on, <laughs> on whether there's a need for a national uh, court of appeals uh, for those cases. But certainly, uh, uh, if Congress decides to do it, then we will uh, uh, do, do <laughs> In its it. infinite wisdom, is that? <laughs> It certainly would change the nature of the court. A somewhat related question, Chief Judge Michelle. Do you have a, a view about what the what the sort of optimal number of judges on this court would be now? Is it are you there or is it uh, would you well, would... <laughs> 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 Plus an occasional season. <laughs> You're not gonna answer that? <laughs> it's, a, it's your prerogative. I'm sorry, I, I did answer, but I must have mumbled the word 12. 12, all right. <laughs> I, I really do think that at 12, we have an optimal balance between cohesion and internal communication and some decent hope of consistency on the one hand and enough horses to haul the wagon on the other hand. And that as you go up from 12, you, of course, get more capacity to handle cases or to handle the same number of cases, perhaps a bit faster. But you start losing rapidly, in my opinion, with each additional judge, the kind of cohesion that's uh, uh, even more important for the Federal Circuit, than perhaps, than any other court of appeals. So uh, I would like to see the caseload adjusted, if necessary, rather than to adjust upward the number of judges on our court. I really think on a considered basis that the optimal number actually is 12. The, uh, sort of a follow-up to that, the court historically has been a loner court in the sense of sending judges out to other circuits. Um, one obvious <coughs> solution or potential solution to a, to the a caseload issue would be to become a borrower court and allow either district court judges or perhaps senior circuit court judges to sit on the federal circuit. Is there any thought given to changing the, that basic approach at this point or views on that? We, we discuss it from time to time and the consensus has leaned against it uh, even when it's possible and uh, for many years it wasn't possible to uh, as you say loan and also borrow. The rule is a little bit more forgiving now uh, and the year is sliced up into discrete time frames and we could borrow in months that we weren't lending so uh, we could get around that rule, uh, but there's a concern about having uh, perhaps uh, critical issues of, let's say, uh, patent doctrine uh, decided by uh, judges who never hear these cases or the colleagues of those who try these cases all the time. So uh, I, I, we haven't uh, embarked on any program of seeking volunteers from other courts. We do lend. And we should lend, in my view, because the other circuits, uh, particularly circuits like the Ninth and the Second and the Fifth and several others for that matter, are severely uh, impacted with caseloads vastly heavier than ours, with heavy numbers of immigration uh, and criminal cases involving people who are incarcerated. And so uh, we regularly lend both uh, active and senior judges to those other courts. And uh, I think that's appropriate. Uh, those are emergency situations. It also, in my view, is very beneficial to all of our judges who, who can muster the energy to fill their quota. We do have a quota here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also sit uh, overtime, you could say, on other circuits, because I think it makes us better judges. We deal with different kinds of cases, we, we have new challenges, we, we, we mix it up with uh, uh, counterpart judges on the regional circuit. So I think there's a lot of benefit in, in, in the current practice. I, I'd be inclined to think uh, we probably will stay fairly close to what we do now for a while. Judge Garza, last time we were together, uh, I asked you a question about the post-argument deliberations, and uh, you went through a, a nice description of that. Uh, and, but I think it's important for the advocates in general and, and for their clients to get a better sense of exactly how quickly the court decides and, and, and what goes on in that conference, because obviously most of us are, are never going to be privy to those conversations, and any information we can get on it is extremely valuable. Carter, in order to uh, answer that question, I think 
you have to lay the groundwork also from the oral argument point of view. Right. The aspects of oral argument, as has been pointed out, uh, need to be focused. Need to be focused on the issues in which the parties believe that the court below made an error. Because, as Judge Baker pointed out, we are a, an appeals court, and the basis of a reversal would have to be based upon a legal error below. This is why it's required and necessary for the parties to focus on the issues of whether or not an error was made below to give the panel at least the opportunity to focus on that issue. Now, whether the argument is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes per side, I think it's totally material. I think it's important for the parties to lay out the issues that are necessary for the panel to understand the case, understand where the alleged error was made. After oral argument is completed, whether it's two hours or three hours, there is a, an immediate conference by the panel. The panel will meet and discuss each case. The issues are laid out. The most junior member of the panel starts with a discussion. The next ranking member of the panel is then allowed to discuss the issues. And finally, the most senior member of the panel also becomes involved in the argument. It doesn't necessarily fall in that particular line, but for the most part, that's the way it's done. There's a straw vote on each case, which is made at that point in time. Once the four cases are discussed and voted upon, the senior member of the panel will essentially divide the writing assignments, the authoring assignments for each one of the cases. And that is done on the basis of equating the work, allowing each one of the judges, for the most part, to make a determination of whether or not the issues are to be covered in a particular opinion. It's not drafted until after all of the issues are outlined, and the panel decides which issues to cover. The panel also decides whether to make it PREC or non-PREC at that point in time. Once the authoring assignments are completed, then the panel disbands to uh, essentially decide how they're going to be able to uh, handle their particular cases for the next day. But what is important is to understand that each one of the judges does have the opportunity at that point to discuss the issues. And we also discuss the issues that are raised in oral argument. This is why it's critical for you to at least point out the errors, because those are the times that the determinations are made right after the oral argument. It's critical. The other aspect that you should know is that each case is probably discussed five, ten minutes for the most part. So it could take a half hour, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, some cases longer than others. And there are a number of cases that after the straw vote is taken that don't write up the way the panel originally believed to be the final result. So there is also further discussion after the initial conference. But for the most part, the authoring judge who was given the assignment will draft up the opinion, circulate it to the panel, and at that point is the majority has made a determination as to whether or not to accept the panel, the authoring judge's panel uh, opinion. And sometimes what you do point out is that, uh, as Judge Lurie noted, what uh, came in as a two-to-one opinion could change. Sometimes the panel opinion is written in such a way that uh, the dissent evaporates. Or in the alternative, the dissent might be written in such a manner that the judge who originally dissented becomes the author of the judge. 
So there are a bunch of varied and different approaches to the final determination of a panel opinion. But it's important to recognize that they are made, the initial straw vote is taken immediately after the oral argument is undertaken by the panel. It's a critical time when uh, the judges do discuss the issues, and for the most part, it's the first time that the judges have discussed the issues together. So from that perspective, I think good, strong advocacy is very, very important, very critical. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, w I've been you know, enjoying that I've got to end this promptly, uh, or at least on time, and, and we're almost there. But I did want to give Judge Prost the opportunity to answer what was the last question, which is, are there any real pet peeves you have? One thing that you wish lawyers would do differently than they do? <laughs> I think, one piece of advice we can give everybody. <laughs> I think you've all heard it before from my colleagues, and it's hard to come up with something new and different. I'll just say briefly, presumably every case has its own strengths and its own weaknesses, and we're all pretty smart up here, and we certainly have smart law clerks. You can't hide the weaknesses. Best off to deal with those as well as the strengths. Great. On that note, uh, we, we are adjourned. We appreciate the opportunity. I hope you all enjoyed it. And we're <laughs> May I have your attention, please? Uh, they're going to uh, reset this room in 45 minutes for dinner. Uh, if you would take all of your personal belongings out with you when you come back in in 45 minutes, they will all be set for uh, lunch and uh, you can take over there. Tuesday on the C-SPAN Networks begins with Washington Journal and a look at U.S. funds for international family planning. Also a senior advisor to Secretary Rice on Iraq's new government and Congressman Gary Ackerman on sanctions against the Palestinian Authority. Washington Journal starts with your calls at 7 a.m. Eastern. And the House is in at 10 to look at agriculture appropriations. On C-SPAN 2, the Senate continues with the immigration bill final passage is expected by the week's end. In the morning, on C-SPAN 3, the FTC chairman joins a hearing on gas prices. And at 2 p.m., a House subcommittee on federal aid for state drug enforcement programs. Next Wednesday, May 31st, through Friday, June 2nd, C-SPAN takes you inside the public